Hello everyone, and welcome back to Physics-Based Animation. In the last video, we learned how to use the projected Gauss-Seidel algorithm to resolve collisions between rigid bodies. In this video, we are going to leave solid bodies behind, both rigid and deformable, and enter the splashy world of fluid simulation, which is responsible for some of the most eye-popping scenes in movies and video games. Before we get going, I want to give an unendorsed shout-out to this excellent book by Robert Bridson. Most of what follows is heavily based on this text, and if you only ever read one book on physics-based animation, cover to cover, of any kind, I think this is a good one to recommend. So give it a look. Okay, it's time to simulate some fluids. As always, our first step in building a simulator is to derive some equations of motion. Rather than follow our normal variational approach, we are going to do something different here, and take a vectorial approach. And while the variational approach certainly applies, it's arguably less standard in fluid simulation literature. Plus, it's fun to see alternative ways to derive all this stuff. So let's begin by asking ourselves a basic question. What are the equations of motion for a tiny particle of fluid? Well, they will just be Newton's second law. The time rate of change of the particle momentum will be equal to the applied force. But what is the mass of the particle? What are those forces? Well, let's find out. In fact, it's quite difficult to talk about the mass of an infinitesimal particle of fluid. So instead, let's consider a small fluid volume, omega, centered around our particle. And we'll assume that the fluid volume translates with our particle. It's basically like a little simplified rigid body. Its position over time is going to be a function, x, of time t, and its velocity is the time derivative of this position function. Finally, its acceleration will be the time derivative of the velocity. So really nothing too surprising at this point. Our particle is going to get pushed around by forces, and these forces are going to act on the surface of this fluid volume. This is like poking a marble with your finger. And of course we can have forces acting at each point on the surface. If we sum up all these forces, we get the total force acting on the fluid volume. And this relates to the acceleration. And this relationship is Newton's second law. Here's Newton's second law again and now we can start adapting it to our fluid volume. The first step is to make the notion of fluid volume mass more concrete. While the mass of a tiny particle of fluid is a little bit difficult to talk about, we can always look up the density of a liquid or a fluid on Wikipedia. Now the mass of a little tiny portion of our fluid volume is going to be the density times the volume, which we're going to call d omega. But we can't relate this to our forces since the forces act on the whole fluid blob, not just a tiny part. To calculate the appropriate momentum change for the entire fluid blob, we need to integrate over the entire volume, which gives us a reasonable left-hand side for Newton's second law. However, the right-hand side, the forces, are still a bit nebulous. So let's see if we can make that a bit clearer. And to do this, we're going to have to zoom in a little bit. Remember that our forces act on the surface of our object. Just like with mass, it's easier to understand forces acting on a small surface patch of our fluid blob. So rather than talk about force, we are going to introduce the concept of traction. Attraction is a force per unit area kind of like a force density. This means that the force acting on a tiny patch of our fluid volume 
is given by the traction times the infinitesimal area of this surface patch. Our surface patch doesn't just have area, but also orientation, which is succinctly captured by its outward-facing surface normal. Using this surface normal, we are going to divide our traction into two parts. The first part of the traction is pressure. By definition, the pressure is a traction that acts normal to the surface of our blob. We write this as negative p times the surface normal, indicating that positive pressure implies our blob is being squeezed by all the other fluid around it. And we're going to stuff the rest of the tractions into a remainder term, r. We can make r a bit more manageable by noting that we can create any traction vector we want by linearly transforming the surface normal n. Here tau is a 3 by 3 matrix that does just that. Often you see this matrix referred to as the deviatoric component of the stress. This is a useful thing to know if you find yourself at a party with a bunch of fluid dynamicists but it's not going to play much of a role in our video going forward. Finally, the total force acting on our fluid volume is just the integral over the whole surface of all the tractions. And now we can equate this to the momentum change of our fluid volume. One issue remains. We have a volume integral on one side of this equation and a surface integral on the other. And that's kind of gross. Fortunately, we can alleviate this grossness by invoking the divergence theorem to convert our surface integral into a volume integral. You've actually seen this trick in reverse before. We used it to enable surface-only integration for the mass matrix of rigid objects. This leaves us with the following form of Newton's second law for an arbitrary blob of fluid. Now, because our fluid blob is arbitrarily chosen, we want this integral to hold for any volume omega. And the easiest way to ensure that it does is to make it hold for every point in the fluid. This implies that rather than satisfy the integrated equality, we want to satisfy the equality in a pointwise fashion. This gives us the following equation. Now this is a totally valid equation of motion for an arbitrary point in a fluid, but we are going to do a bit more work to put it in a more familiar form. Now, due to the nature of fluids, there's an additional complication when computing the acceleration, which is the time derivative of our fluid velocity. A fundamental part of things like the tetrahedral finite element method for deformable solids was establishing a mapping between the undeformed and deformed space of our object. The undeformed state was the state in which the elastic potential energy was minimized. Now fluids like water have many such states, so there's really no good way to establish this mapping. The end result is that we're not even going to try. So rather than parameterize things like velocity using a reference state or undeformed state coordinate, we're going to associate these properties with the current position of our fluid blob, which is given by the function x of t. And here lies the complication. Our velocity at any point in space can instantaneously change in time due to some acceleration due to applied forces, but also due to the motion of the fluid blob itself. So what does it mean to compute the time rate of change for such a quantity? Well, what it means is that we have to invoke a fancier time derivative, which we call the material derivative. The material derivative formula comes from applying the chain rule 
to our new velocity formulation. And it gives us something that looks like this. Here, I'm storing the gradient of v in matrix form. For a more in-depth look at the material derivative, you can see the material derivative video linked to in the description below. That's right, this particular time derivative is so interesting, there's an entirely separate video available that discusses just this one chamber. Substituting this into our previous equation of motion gives us the famous Navier-Stokes equation, which describes the motion of any fluid. A quick note that we've added a force of gravity so that points in our fluid react both to gravity and surface tractions. There's still one missing piece here, though. In graphics, we typically simulate fluids like water, which are very hard to compress. You have to apply a lot of pressure to change their volume. We model this property by adding an incompressibility constraint the famous divergence-free constraint that forms the heart of many fluid simulation algorithms. Together with the Navier-Stokes equations, this constraint gives us the incompressible Navier-Stokes equations. Finally, we will make one more simplification. We will assume that our fluid blobs only experience pressure forces and forces due to gravity. Such fluids are called inviscid. Things like air and water can be modeled as inviscid fluids, which is why so much time and effort has been devoted to solving the equations of motion for such inviscid flows. Doing just that is going to be the focus of the remainder of this video. Before we start our deep dive into an algorithm for simulating inviscid fluids, let's start by making an observation that these equations of motion really deal with three distinct effects. The first is the change in velocity due to the movement of the fluid, also called advection. The second is the instantaneous acceleration due to external forces like gravity. And the third is the action of the pressure, which is attempting to keep our fluid from compressing. This observation is going to allow us to solve the inviscid equations of motion by handling each of these effects individually. So given some divergence-free or incompressible velocity field at the current time t, we will compute a new velocity field at time t plus 1 by first advecting our fluid then accounting for external forces, and finally making this whole mess divergence-free, a step commonly referred to as the pressure projection. However, before we can make any more progress, we have to choose a discretization to represent our fluid. For deforming solids, our discretizations were tetrahedral or triangular meshes. While we could use these same representations for fluid simulation, they would quickly become tangled up due to the complicated flow of the fluid, and maintaining nice meshes would become pretty difficult. So instead, we will represent our fluid using a set of disconnected particles. Each particle will store all the information we need to know about the fluid at that point in space including its position and velocity. Now let's use our box of particles to do some fluid simulation. And we'll start with solving the advection problem. When we talk about advection, we are really talking about dealing with this velocity time derivative. And because we handle all the external forces and pressure forces at later stages in our simulation algorithm, we're really making the assumption that acceleration is zero for this step. That means that there's no instantaneous change in the velocity, so our velocity should only change 
with the movement of the particles, changes in x, rather than with changes in the second isolated time variable. So what we are saying is that if we move some chunk of fluid and check the velocity at the new location of that fluid chunk, that velocity should be the same as what it originally was. A discrete version of that statement looks like this, where x of t is the current position of the fluid chunk, and x at t plus delta t is the updated position after we move it. We can compute this updated position using a standard first order explicit update. Now I'm going to claim that solving this problem just amounts to moving our particles using this update rule. But let's not take my word for it, let's check. Here's a particle at position x of t moving with some velocity v sub i. It represents a small chunk of fluid. Here's the same particle again after we've moved it to its new position x at t plus delta t using our update rule. Now we just need to ensure that the fluid velocity at the previous and current positions are the same. But that's automatically true. Why? Well, this particle was already storing the fluid velocity vector. Moving the particle didn't change that stored value, and this trivially satisfies our advection equation. This means that solving our advection equation just requires moving our particles around according to their velocities. Okay, so that's the advection term taken care of in a pleasantly elegant way. Let's move on to tackling external forces. So we've moved our particle, and now we want to understand the effect of external forces, things like gravity. External forces change the instantaneous velocity of a fluid particle. So this step is really concerned with changing our second time variable. Remember, we already handled the effect of changing x of t during our advection stage. So we can apply our first order time discretization again, and this gives us a simple update rule for the velocity. A quick note that we only need to use the acceleration due to gravity in this case because density appears on both sides of the equation, and so we can cancel it out. Back to this equation which tells us to update the velocity directly using the acceleration due to gravity, but without moving our particles. Here's our particle after advection, along with the force due to gravity, and all we are going to do is update the velocity stored on that particle. And that's that! External force is done, which means we can move on to the central component of a fluid simulator, the pressure projection. Pressure projection is much more involved than the other two stages of fluid simulation because it involves solving a partial differential equation subject to a constraint. The first thing we need to do is try and synthesize a more computationally useful relationship between these two disparate pieces. We can start by discretizing our time derivative using our first order update rule, which gives us a formula for velocity at the next time step. This is exactly what we did when dealing with external forces, except that now our force comes from the gradient of the pressure. Next, we can take the divergence of this new velocity, and we know from our constraints that this should be equal to zero. The equation for our updated velocity only contains one unknown, the pressure, P. Our job is to find a pressure that makes this equation satisfied. 
Putting all our known values on the right-hand side gives us the following Poisson equation, a type of partial differential equation, or PDE, that we need to solve for the pressure. Updating our velocity with this new pressure will give us a divergence-free velocity field. So how do we solve this partial differential equation? Well, we could use finite elements to do this, but in fluids, the standard approach is to use finite differences. Finite difference approaches directly discretize the PDE itself rather than an integrated version, which is what finite elements do. To do this properly, we need to use a bit of a wonky data structure, something called a staggered grid. The staggered grid starts with the observation that any vector, and here it's our velocity vector, is made up of independent scalar components. We'll call them u and v. The neat idea is that we don't need to store these components at the same place on the grid. And so we don't need u and v to be available at every point on the grid. Rather, we can store the x components of our velocity vector on the vertical edges of our grid and the y components on the horizontal edges. Finally, we will store pressure values at the center of each grid cell. This staggered storage of variables amounts to storing each component of the velocity and the pressure on a different offset grid. So for instance, Here's the grid for y components of the velocity. Here's the grid for the x components of the velocity. And here's the grid for our pressure samples. This arrangement of variables is going to make it very easy for us to solve our Poisson problem. And while we will focus on 2D staggered grids in this video for didactic reasons, be aware that a 3D variant exists and that all the concepts that we discuss carry over in a relatively straightforward manner. Here's our Poisson problem. And we can see that there are a number of different differential quantities that we need to compute. Let's start with this one, the divergence of our current velocity stored on the staggered grid. This is the formula for divergence in 2D. What happens if we try to discretize this using first order finite difference approximations of both derivatives? Well, that's gonna look like this. We get two first order finite differences, one in X and one in Y, which we sum up to arrive at the divergence. Now the point of the staggered grid is going to start becoming apparent. Our x derivative is approximated by subtracting our x velocity components, which intuitively computes this derivative at the cell center. And the same is true of our y derivative. Now we can add these two values up to arrive at a formula for the divergence at the center of this grid cell. Because the divergence formula is linear in the grid variables, we can rewrite it as a matrix vector product. Where we introduce the matrix B, our divergence operator, and the vector Q sub J, which is the stacked vector of velocity variables for our grid cell. And this lets us express the divergence of our velocity field in a very compact form. Okay, we have a divergence operator. Now we need a gradient operator to complete the picture. Because the pressure is a scalar field, its gradient has two components. The x component is the derivative of the pressure with respect to x, and the y component is the derivative of the pressure with respect to y. Let's look at computing the x component of the pressure gradient. 
Again, we use first order finite differences and we see that applying this to our pressure samples will compute the x component of the pressure gradient on the vertical edges of our grid. At the same point which we store the x component of the fluid velocity. And we can do the same thing using the pressure samples spanning the other vertical wall to get another value of the x component of the pressure field. We can apply the exact same strategy to compute the y components of the pressure gradient and these will lie on the horizontal edges of our grid cells. And like the divergence computation, this gradient computation is linear in the grid values, and so we can express it as a matrix vector equation. Here P sub J is the stacked vector of pressure values needed to compute the gradients for our current cell, and D is our gradient operator. This lets us rewrite our gradient like this. And now we can use all these operators to fully discretize our Poisson equation, which looks like this. Quite a compact discretization, all enabled by our staggered representation. Now we get one of these equations for each grid cell, and just like in previous cases with finite elements, we can assemble them into a global linear system and solve it. Now, typically in fluid simulation, you solve this using an iterative solver, and the conjugate gradient method is one of the most popular solvers to use. And that's really the basics of the pressure projection algorithm. But we're missing a very important ingredient. Boundary conditions. Up to this point, we've been considering fluids in isolation, but this is a case that rarely occurs in real life. More often than not, our fluids are going to interact with things in the world, things like solid objects. So how do we include this in our fluid simulator? Well, we are going to do this by modifying the pressure solve itself. If our fluid is contained in a solid box, what we really want is to prevent it from flowing through these boundaries. This is the same as saying that the fluid velocity should flow along the wall or be tangential to it. In other words, the velocity projected onto the outward facing surface normal of our boundary should be equal to zero. For axis aligned boundaries, our staggered grid makes this very easy since we just need to constrain the appropriate velocity sample to be equal to zero. So how do we incorporate that into our discrete pressure equations? Well, we do that by introducing the standard fixed point projection matrix, which we learned about way back in video two in our exploration of mass spring systems. Here, this projection matrix P shows up in the form of a square matrix P transpose times P. And this produces a very special matrix. That matrix is an identity matrix with zeros on the diagonal corresponding to the velocity samples we wish to zero out. For each cell that has a solid boundary condition, we insert our appropriate constraint matrix and assemble as usual. This will enforce solid boundary conditions in our pressure solve. So in the end, that's not too bad. With solid boundary conditions, you are now capable of doing really cool smoke simulations like this one. So this is just smoke churning around in a box, 
and the walls of that box are implemented using solid boundary conditions. However, if we want to extend this to simulating liquids like water, we need to do a bit more work. There's one other type of boundary condition that's critical for liquid simulation, and that's called the free surface boundary condition. When we simulate liquid, we need to account for the fact that only part of the simulation volume is filled with water. The other part is filled with air. In fluid simulation, we typically ignore the air, and so really, this empty portion is just a void. We'll use the terms air and void interchangeably in this discussion. How do we account for the interaction between the void and our liquid? Well, we make the observation that the nothingness of the void can't push on our liquid. And because pressure is the pushing force, this implies that we have a zero pressure boundary condition at the liquid or free surface. The first step in modeling the free surface boundary condition is to label all the cells in our staggered grid as either air cells or fluid cells. Fluid cells are cells for which the pressure sample at the center of the cell is inside the fluid volume, and air cells are the opposite, so the pressure sample is outside the fluid volume. We are going to use the pressures in the air cells to satisfy our free surface boundary condition. For each air cell, we can draw a line from its pressure sample to the pressure samples in the neighboring fluid cells. Intersecting this line with the fluid surface gives us the points at which we will try and satisfy our free surface boundary condition. And we're going to do this by calculating fake pressures in the air that do just that. We call these fake pressures ghost pressures. Spooky. We will assume that the pressure at a free surface point is given by the linear interpolation of a ghost pressure and a fluid pressure. At the fluid boundary, we want the pressure to be equal to zero. Now here, alpha is just the linear interpolation parameter, and you can compute it by looking at the relative position of the free surface and the pressure samples sitting at the endpoints of this line. We can solve this equation for the value of our ghost pressure, so the pressure in the air cell. Because our ghost pressure lives in an air cell and we treat air as empty space, we no longer need to include the air cell in our pressure projection. So we omit them when we assemble our global pressure projection matrix. For fluid cells, we then modify our gradient operator to take our ghost pressures into account. For the case that we've just seen, that looks like this. And we can see the appearance of our ghost pressure term modifying our finite difference calculation. We can then assemble the global pressure projection matrix and solve for the pressures. And that's really the last piece of the puzzle in our fluid simulation algorithm. We now know how to solve all of the individual stages of this framework in isolation. So let's look at how to put this all together. Given our input velocity field v at t, we start by computing a new velocity field via advection, which just means moving our particles around. Next, we apply our external forces by adding them to the particle velocities, 
Then we take our updated velocity field and perform our pressure solve. Finally, we use these computed pressures to update our velocity field to make it divergence-free. Now this doesn't look too bad, but there's a problem. Our pressure projection is performed using the staggered grid, but all the other stages of the algorithm are performed on particles. So we need to figure out how to move quantities like velocity from our particles to our grid and vice versa. Let's start by looking at how we can take a velocity field stored on our particles and transfer it onto our staggered grid in order to do the pressure solve. Let's zoom in a bit. Here we see a subset of our fluid particles occupying a single grid cell in our staggered grid. It's not really obvious from this picture how to compute the staggered grid velocities. However, remember that our staggered grid in 2D can also be thought of as three separate regular grids, one for the x component of the velocity, one for the y component, and one for the pressure samples. Now we won't need the pressure sample grid for this, but we'll need the other two. Here's the y component grid, and we can look at a single grid cell and label the vertices of this grid cell. So here we've labeled them a, b, c, and d. We are going to construct the values of the y component of the velocity at the grid vertices using a weighted average of the particle velocities. In other words, for a grid vertex A, we can say that the y component of the velocity stored there is the weighted sum over all the particles occupying the grid cell. And remember, here V sub i is the y component of the velocity of the ith particle. Typically, we use bilinear, or in 3D, trilinear weights for this computation. These are the weights used to bilinearly interpolate a function over the grid cell, and they are readily available on Wikipedia. Doing this for each grid cell, on each per-component grid, will map our particle velocities onto our staggered grid, and this will allow us to perform our pressure projection. We transfer particle velocities to the grid after applying the external forces. And again, this enables us to perform pressure projection. And now there's just one more thing we need to take care of. After we perform the pressure projection, we need to transfer our grid velocities back to the particles. Now there are in fact two major categories of grid-to-particle transfer operation. The first type of grid-to-particle transfer is called the pick transfer, or particle and cell. And similarly to particle-to-grid transfer, we do this on a per-component basis. To rebuild the y component of the particle velocity, we use the y grid from the staggered arrangement and we reconstruct the y component of each particle's velocity using bilinear interpolation from the grid nodes. If we do this for each component of the particle velocity, so x and y in 2D and x and y and z in 3D, we will reconstruct a full velocity vector for each particle. Alternately, one can use what's called the flip update strategy, or fluid implicit particle transfer. Here, rather than copy the full grid velocity onto each particle, we instead compute the change in grid velocity caused by the pressure solve. And we transfer this to the particles and use it to update the particle velocity. Because we are updating and not replacing the particle velocity entirely, flip simulations tend to look more energetic and splashy than pick simulations. In fact, people often use weighted combinations of pick and flip transfer to customize the appearance of their fluid simulation.
grid-to-particle transfer is really the final piece of our fluid simulation puzzle. It allows us to complete the simulation by computing our updated particle velocity. And with that, you can now create some staggeringly beautiful fluid simulations, like this one. And so after all of this, we come to the end of this video series on physics-based animation. We've seen springs and finite elements, deformable objects, rigid bodies, collisions, and fluids. It's been a wild ride, and I hope you've enjoyed it. But remember, this is really only the beginning. We're only scratching the surface of the amazing physical phenomena that are out there to be simulated. So while I'll be taking a break for a bit, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw each other back here again at some point. As always, thanks for watching.